Principles of Economics, my complete guide to understanding economics is now available in hardcover, audiobook, and ebook from Safeddeen.com, Amazon, and many more booksellers worldwide. And now I am also teaching a course based on this book on my website, Safeddeen.com. Principles of Economics will run the whole academic year from September to June, and will have a new lecture every two weeks, as well as weekly live online discussion seminars open to learners from all over the world and from all walks of life. Whether you're a student, a professional, or a retiree, you are making economic decisions every day, and this course will arm you with the wisdom of centuries of economists to improve your economic decision-making. You'll also get a free book of Principles of Economics if you sign up for the course, and if you do it before September 20th, you'll get a 20% discount. Go to safeddean.com and sign up now. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is the Bitcoiner's answer to fiat health insurance. If you listen to this show, you've probably heard me rail against the problems of modern healthcare and health insurance. CrowdHealth is a brilliant new solution to this problem that leverages the power of Bitcoin to help people get affordable healthcare. CrowdHealth holds its cash reserves in Bitcoin. It negotiates with healthcare providers on your behalf and gets you much better rates by offering to pay them cash upfront without having to go through the expensive bureaucracy of modern healthcare insurance. It's a solution that works better for healthcare providers and for patients by disintermediating large insurance companies who have the wrong incentives and are constantly raising costs. I'm very happy to have signed up for Crowd Health and I'm really excited to support them as they disrupt the fiat health insurance industry. Go to joincrowdhealth.com and use the discount code SAFE, S-A-I-F, and you'll get the first six months for $99 only. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by CoinKite. CoinKite are my favorite makers of Bitcoin hardware. They produce the legendary Open Dime, the first Bitcoin bearer asset, as well as the reliable cold card hardware wallet, the excellent stainless steel seed plates for storing your seed phrases, and the block clock. Now, CoinKite have produced the Sats card, a card the size of a credit card which can store Bitcoin and works great as a gift. CoinKite have just produced a limited edition gorgeous Bitcoin standard Sats card, which carries the Bitcoin standard logo, and you can get it from coinkite.shop slash Bitcoin standard. Use the code Bitcoin standard to get 5% off your purchase. Hello, welcome to another episode of the Bitcoin standard podcast. Our guest today is Ryan McLeod. Ryan is a lab technologist that works at Canada's national nuclear laboratory, supports various material safety and research projects. He began to take a serious interest in Bitcoin at around the same time that he was learning about the ambitious plans of the nuclear industry to deploy a new generation of power reactors. He assembled a team that won the North American Young Generation and Innovative for Nuclear Idea contest by proposing Bitcoin mining as a means of anchoring nuclear power deployments of all kinds, big and small, with a perpetually available consumer of surplus generation. Ryan, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It's a great honor to be here to speak with you, Safe. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you. I'm a big fan of nuclear energy. I'm a big fan of all forms of energy. It's uh, my dream to die not before uh, the world has 10x its consumption of uh, energy. And uh, that means 10x nuclear, 10x coal, 10x oil, everything. Although probably, you know, with nuclear, we should probably do 100x. We could easily, if you unleash nuclear, we could probably do 100x. We were on our way decades ago. It seemed like that was the trajectory, but things got derailed a few times. But uh, we're back. Yeah, we want to talk about that. So um, tell us, first of all, what uh, drew you into the nuclear industry and um, what, what, what is it that you find interesting about it? Me personally, I was became educated as a chemical technologist. And then I had a few jobs and then in Ontario, where, where I live, getting a employment as whatever you can in the nuclear industry is one of like the top notch like uh, places of employment so whether it's at the reactors or or in the research the energy is is a good sector to get into and and new ontario has a reputation for having one of the world class nuclear infrastructure and programs for education and supply chains and and labor markets and unions and it's yeah, tier tier 1 nuclear state here in ontario and then i became working at the research facility where I work about nine years ago. And for the most of the time period, it was just a job. I participated in some like extracurriculars with the uh, institutions like North American Young Generation and Nuclear and went to some of their events. And then it was in 21 when a small amount of Bitcoin that I had stashed in a wallet became a reasonably large amount of Bitcoin. I started to take it seriously and 
my previous touch points of Bitcoin were from being exposed to to Max Kaiser way back in 2011, 2012 period of time. So I listened to lots of podcasts. So I went to see if Max had a podcast and then I started listening to Max's podcast. And then eventually he kept talking about Michael Saylor. And at the time I had no idea who this guy was. So I started looking up Michael Saylor podcast and then came across one that you had done with him. And then I was enthralled with the way that he speaks so eloquently about Bitcoin and energy and all of these topics that I've, I'm now like really enthralled with myself. And then that led me to find Breed Loves Podcast and the original Sailor series that he did, and then Jeff Booth. And then, yeah, before I knew it, my entire podcast was just all Bitcoin. And then as I started learning about mining, I was speaking with my wife one night around the same time that Elon Musk had crapped on the energy usage of Bitcoin and caused the market to dump in would have been April-ish of 21, maybe May-ish. And she proposed the idea of well, we work for a nuclear research company that's going to be involved in the development of small modular reactors. If the energy usage and the sources of energy uses are an issue to certain people, getting it more integrated with nuclear power and Bitcoin mining would basically obliterate that line of FUD because there's a power source that has zero carbon whatsoever associated with it, except for like a little bit in steel and concrete manufacturing in the, in the early manufacturing stage of a nuclear power plant. But once it's built and operating, it's just boiling water. But then, yeah, and then that forced me to really dig into where are we with SMRs? Where's the state of the industry? Like before then I was just, it was great to be working in the street. It's a well-paid job, like great union. But then I started to get more into the nuclear activism side and seeing the mess that that has been over the last few decades and seeing that there's been a resurgence, well, not even like a resurgence, it seems like for the first time there is a substantial growing grassroots movement of pro-nuclear act activists that have kind of coalesced around the idea that nuclear power is essential if the claims that we need to be more reliant against any major changes in the climate and potentially yeah, to manage and survive into the future. Like I'm more about resilience and reliability ahead of whether it's clean or not, because people that are poor, that don't have access to good electricity, caring whether it's clean or not is low of their priorities. They just want to have something reliable that they can turn the lights on with. So a lot of people don't really even start to think about these topics until it starts to become an issue where they're being told that part of the day, they're not going to be able to turn on their furnace or turn on their air conditioner. And as far as I'm concerned, that's, that's a failure of managing these complex systems that for decades have worked perfectly fine with the energy sources that we've had available to us. And it hasn't been until recently when we've started adding more intermittent sources that we start to have these complications in managing the generation and demand and delivery all together in one package. Like it's great that yeah, wind and solar are super cheap when they're generating, but they, those costs are transferred into delivering it to the consumers and managing that. So it's a lot of second order effects that aren't taken into consideration by people that tend to only look at the immediate circumstances when it's, once it's built and once it's generating, but when you, and then they'll focus on all of the trade-offs of nuclear power and the negative and like everything, because they have a favored technology, they'll focus on the negatives of the one they don't want to succeed while only focusing on the positives that they want to succeed. And then everybody's fighting over who tells the better story to the policymakers that decide who gets better seats at the subsidy trough and who gets better tax credits. And then we're seeing a lot now, a lot of the arguments being is about it costs a lot and it's too expensive. And any money that's being invested in nuclear power is money that's not being invested in wind and solar. So it's a lot of fighting over the financing and who can convince the financiers they've got a better story to tell and a better technology to sell because it seems like when it's on an even playing field the investors want to lean towards nuclear but it's just been relegated to these controversial high cost of capital investment categories that nobody really wants to touch and now like there's been a few instances where we finally have built some of these new reactors like uh, Vogel and Georgia has just come online so that's that's the first successful like AP 1000 reactor that's been built in North America in in decades so they should be taking the momentum of that and just stamping out many of those reactors because that's where you recoup a lot of those that 
capital cost that goes into building the first one because it's got to be engineered, it's got to be licensed. And once all of that is done and front loaded, then you can, if you can spread more of that across a larger fleet of reactors, then you're going to co reduce the marginal cost of each individual unit going forward and you'll have a more robust supply chain. You'll have a much better labor force because that's one of the major issues that they've had is if you let your labor force and your supply chains atrophy, then you're basically starting over from square one and you've got a huge generation gap in the people with the experience and, and capabilities of building these large infrastructure projects. Yeah. So that's one thing about like in Germany, like, yeah, every day that they don't turn those reactors back on, it becomes infinitely like exponentially more challenging to turn them back on. Yeah, it's absolutely mind boggling. You, you've you've touched on a lot of things that I want to pick apart and talk about. But first, let me just begin with a little bit of context for the listeners. I make this point in my uh, book, my newest book, uh, Principles of Economics. I have a whole chapter on energy and power. And I think I try and approach the question from first principles as an economic analysis and try and explain the economics of energy in the same way that we as Austrians generally think of economics in general, using marginal analysis and thinking about the uh, implications of human action and why humans use energy sources. So to begin with, we look at the, and I think a very useful metric to begin with is energy abundance, just how much energy can you get per kilogram of a particular fuel. And this, I think, sets uh, the context up really nicely. For wood, for instance, which humanity had relied upon for thousands and thousands of years, it was the most significant source of energy that most people had, um, but it was very expensive to get. But once you got it, you got 16 megajoules per kilogram of energy in wood. That's what you get. So if you think about a one kilogram log of wood, you burn that, that gives you about 16 megajoules. Now, if you had coal, on the other hand, you'd get 50% more, which is about 24 megajoules per kilogram of coal. So coal is more energy dense than wood. It gets you 24 megajoule per kilogram. Oil, on the other hand, is even more dense, almost twice as much density of energy as coal. So it gives you 44 megajoules per kilogram. And natural gas will get you 55 megajoules per kilogram. So natural gas is the densest of the hydrocarbons. It gets you 55 megajoules for, per kilogram. Now for nuclear, on the other hand, uh, it's 3,900,000 megajoules per kilogram. It's, yeah, just it's a, not even in the same category. It's yeah. orders of magnitude better. Yeah, it's, it's 100,000 times higher than uh, your average hydrocarbon. So it's basically oil times 100,000 is the difference here. So for you know one kilogram of oil, you could get that energy from one over 100,000 of a kilogram of uh, nuclear fuel. Uh, so that's a pretty startling statistic when you think about it. I brought up a simple little infographic that, that captures it pretty well. It just shows the... The amount of hours that a 100-watt light bulb can be kept on by a kilogram of fuel. And if it's wood, yeah. 1.2 days, coal, 3.8 days, oil, 4.8, and one kilogram of uranium can keep a light bulb on for 11,700 years. So. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not even comparable. Uh, the, the, there's, no, the, there's no comparison of the kind of fuel. So in, in, when you think of it this way, it becomes pretty clear that nuclear is really the most advanced form of technology that we have for energy generation. And in fact, human society, and what I argue in uh, Principles of Economics, human society and human technology is a constant quest to try and find better, more energy dense sources of power. We're constantly looking at whatever we can use to provide us with warmth, with locomotion, or with electricity. And we're burning these things. You can make uh, electricity and the heat from all of those things. But the more dense they are, the more we move on to them. And human technology is just constantly finding the thing that's denser. So around the 1500s, we moved to coal. Around the 1900s, we moved to oil. And then in the 20th century, uh, gas. And then also in the 20th century, nuclear power. Now, if you had just discovered nuclear power in the 1950s and then went into a coma for 70 years and you understood energy and you understood engineering and you understood economics and you understood that you know we've moved from uh, wood to coal to gas to, to oil to gas clearly the next step is going to be nuclear you would expect that today the world would be blanketed with nuclear power reactors 
yet it isn't. In fact, we are regressing back to 7th century technology, uh, swings and slides, as I like to call them, <laughs> uh, windmills and solar power. We're going back to relying on wind and solar, whose fuel is technically free. And I discuss the absurdity of the term free here because, yeah, you don't pay for sunshine, you don't pay for wind, but you do pay for the land that has to be covered with the solar panels and the land that has to be covered with the windmills. And you have to pay for the windmills and you have to pay for the solar panels and their installation. And, of course, when you factor all of those in, and then when you remember that these things don't work 24-7, they work at best around eight hours a day on average. Because for solar, you know, half the day is night. Anywhere on, the, anywhere on Earth gets uh, half the year is day and half the year is night. Whether you're at the North Pole or whether you're at the equator, it works out the same thing. At the end of the day, you have on average 12 hours of a day per day. But then out of these 12 hours, you know, the early hours of the morning, you can't get solar energy late hours of the afternoon you can't get solar energy out of them so then you're down to about eight nine ten and then anytime it's raining anytime it's cloudy anytime it's dusty and recently discovered anytime it's too hot also your solar panels can't work anymore or at least their generation capacity is reduced so you would be like they also don't like hail and they don't like hail of course they get destroyed by hail they don't tell you that when you buy it um but uh you're, you'll be lucky to get seven hours a day on average at the end of the day. So why have we regressed back to uh, these primitive technologies and why aren't we blanketing the world with nuclear energy? Because radiation's scary. We have a weird relationship with the word radiation. People hear it and they, they think bad, dangerous, something that should be avoided, even though people encounter it every day in any number of ways whether it's just being exposed to sunlight eating a banana and having potassium 40 taking a flight any number of medical procedures like a ct scan will will have some level of radiation involved in it that you're exposed to low levels of radiation are are pretty in, insignificant in the grand scheme of things as especially right now with the linear non-threshold theory being kind of revisited. It was this idea that because a large amount of radiation can be harmful and cause like organ failure and, and all kinds of other negative health consequences, that cumulatively small amounts of radiation can add up to those large doses. But we're finding it's now more like the difference between doing jumping jacks and having small like muscle tears that will repair themselves and be more resilient towards future exposure of radiation compared to jumping off the building. It's like, yes, if you take a massive dose of radiation, it's going to have severe negative health consequences, but it, it does not, we're, it, they're finding more and more that it does not line up the same that if you accumulate very tiny amounts, yeah. that it does not accumulate to the same as a, a large single dose. So that's, so that's being revisited and a lot of policy and regulatory was based off of that assumption. So a lot of that's being revisited. And it's ridiculous because everything everything is toxic at high doses. You know, there's a dose of salt that will kill you. There's a dose of water that will kill you. Everything was toxic at a certain level. You know, you can only drink so much water before your body fails from drinking so much water. Everything is toxic uh, at, at some level. Well, right now, tritium is the big talk because of what's going on at Fukushima. They're trying to to dump the, the wastewater that has a very, very low concentration of tritium, way below the uh, international the environmental standards that everybody has agreed to and adhered to. And because people hear nuclear waste in water, it just, they associate it with that that is a given that there'll be negative consequences, even though tritium is pretty, as far as harmful nucleoids go, tritium is pretty inconsequential. Like it passes through you because it just flows right through, through any, the, any water that you consume will pass out quite quickly and it doesn't tend to bioaccumulate in any of the uh, any of the food chain so they're making this big issue this into a big issue that's actually a nothing burger and they could probably just do all of the dumping pretty rapidly and a lot of people have said that like they would if it wasn't that it was salt water they would happily consume that water to prove to people that it's not safe so now there's like people on these kind of quests to go and consume fish that's been caught out at fukushima to prove that it's not an issue like there's no blinky out there and and actually i when i was in japan last fall we were fed uh, produce that was grown in the fukushima prefecture because 
most of the land area around the reactor is fine. There's a, a small like 100 meter exclusion zone that's kind of kept off limits. But I don't know many other major nat major disasters that are now tourist sites that invite people to come and visit and see the consequences of what happened and how how it was actually well contained. And then be revisiting it, it seems like the reaction to what happened was actually far more severe and consequential to to like the well-being of the people that lived there than the actual event itself like just taking people out of hospitals and dragging them 100 kilometers to park them somewhere else that's a lot more disruptive than being exposed to a, a tiny amount of radiological material that can easily be shielded from so it's it's just yeah humanity just has a really weird relationship with radiation and we need yeah. to get over it I, I agree with you. I think this is something that I've only recently started to consider. And uh, there's quite a lot of evidence out there that suggests that this is yet another in the very long line of stupid hysterias where people are just freaking out about something that does not require that much freaking out about. And in fact, you know, we've, we've had obviously a very powerful experience with that over the respiratory illness hysteria that we had over the last couple of years. And it seems very similar. I think, I mean, in retrospect, when you look back right now, I think it's probably inarguable that the number of people that died and whose lives were disrupted by the insane reaction to the respiratory illness far exceeds whatever the respiratory illness itself did. Because of course, you know, the statistics for what the respiratory illness did are very highly inflated by the fact that you get paid if you report as a hospital, if you report the deaths to have been from that. But in any case, clearly the reaction was very bad. And I think this is also the case in Fukushima. And it seems also the case in Chernobyl. You know, there's so much hysteria around Chernobyl, Chernobyl accident. Yet, you know, uh, when we tally this, when we look back on the last 50 years of nuclear energy, 60 years of nuclear energy, I don't think there is any uh, question that far more people have died installing solar panels than have died in nuclear accidents. And You'd be hard-pressed to find as much as 300 fatalities that can be directly attributed to nuclear power, full, like full life cycle from mining to decommissioning to waste management. Yeah, and I think all other energy sources would likely have more. I mean, coal mines have a lot of accidents happen in them. Um, coal plants have bad things happen in them. You know, industrial processes always contain, contain the risk of accidents and people fall and people make uh, stupid mistakes. And so it's it's natural that you would expect some level of mortality. But it seems that the overreaction with nuclear is absolutely uh, insane. Another another interesting anecdote I heard is there's a city in Iran called Ramsar. Have you ever heard of this city? Yeah, that's one of the ones that gets referenced that, yeah, it just has a high background radiation. And then there's like hot springs or something that, that yeah. they, they, they will go and use. Yeah. Yeah, so this is a city that is known as Paradise on Earth in Persian. It's where the Shah of Iran used to go spend his summers. It's got beautiful palaces. It's where rich people in Iran like to go and spend their time there. And one of the draws of the place is that it has high radiation, and the radiation apparently is good for you. It's always been known to be good for you there, and that's why um, you know the Shah, the king of the country, basically would go and uh, and, and spend his summers there. So maybe there is something to the fact that we are being completely unreasonable hysterical idiots when it comes to radiation yeah and then that hysteria translates into requiring more stringent safety measures when building this infrastructure and then that requires more cost and then be, and then it becomes a self-referential thing when you take measures to cover potential safety issues then the people that don't like nuclear power will use that as justification to claim like oh that was an issue because they actually did something about it so so now we can make a fuss about that issue and then it and, and it just keeps spiraling and then they start influencing policy and then it becomes more expensive to build nuclear power and then we end up in the situation now where yeah a lot of the expertise in north america and the western nations to build nuclear reactors has has been lost to time and there's a desperate race right now to train as many new capable like young nuclear technicians and technologists and engineers from the generation that is still available while they're they are still available so that we can actually like kind of pass on the baton to a new generation to to carry this the resurgence of nuclear power ahead with us is it is very reinvigorating though to go to these conferences with the the younger people in the nuclear sector and seeing that there is a 
a large like there's a lot of enthusiasm they are very optimistic for the future it does feel very similar to vibes to hanging out with the bitcoiners like it's just there's there's a relentless positivity about them that they they do see a path forward that doesn't involve scaring the shit out of everybody so that they will choose the like the higher time preference the solution to the problem because that's like the way i see it is like they're scaring everybody so that they'll be like, we have to solve this problem now. And the only solution that we can implement right now immediately, because nuclear takes too long, is windmills and solar panels. But then if everybody's building windmills and solar panels at the same time, they're going to start cannibalizing each other's markets. They're going to start really approaching diminishing returns. They're only just now starting to have to contend with the fact that the overnight lending rates are way more than they were for the last decade. So that's something that they would like really benefited the these types of projects and you hear these countries are like well we're gonna 90 gigawatts by 2035 100 gigawatts and it's just these absurdly large numbers and it's like that sounds great if you can actually build it and deliver it to the customer but i don't see a realistic way that all of that is going to be pulled off because they're all going because you're going to have grid congestion because when you start building these windmills and solar panels further and further afield you need more transmission infrastructure to get to them and then if they're all generating at the same time they're all using the same transmission infrastructure at the same time so then that causes congestion so then that causes curtailment where and then the theory is that oh we're just going to use batteries then a lot of these a lot of the hopium about batteries is on like a volume and scale and capability of batteries that also does not yet exist well at the same they will they will barrage nuclear power with complaints about oh well you haven't demonstrated these smrs and you're banking a lot of hopium on technology that hasn't been proven yet like kind of it's they haven't been modernized yet but a lot of the technology is based on nuclear technology that was built like in the 60s and 70s that just never got commercialized so it's all of these variables that i i don't think certain people understand how they all play together and how the complexity of the grid actually works together from getting electricity from being generated to being consumed by at the end end user because we're seeing it all over the place now that these giant windmill and solar farms they're being built and then they're just generating electricity into nothing because they've got three four five six years interconnection queues that they're waiting on to actually be able to sell their electricity into the grid so, and that's one of the opportunities that we've noticed a lot of Bitcoin miners are latching on to because they're just like well, free electricity in the middle of nowhere. Well, let's just plug in our computers and we'll take what we can get. But ultimately, I think that they are, this isn't going to last long. Like this phase is going to probably be a few years and it's going to result in probably a lot more wind and solar infrastructure being built than should have been built. And I expect that this generation is going to leave a legacy that. 30, 40 years from now, there's just going to be fields of de decrepit and decayed windmills and solar panels that nobody wants to pay to recycle or maintain in any way. So it's just going to be left to nature to reclaim in the way that uh, she does to all, all the old architecture of ancient civilizations. We're just going to have, that'll be our modern contribution to what nature reclaims. Well, in the meantime, people are going to kind of move back towards nuclear power. Like all these countries, they're they're moving towards nuclear power. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's pretty sad to imagine if we don't happen to leave a written record behind, um, which you know is pretty likely because we're uh, we're getting rid of paper and we're putting everything digital. So, in case of some major cataclysm and uh, catastrophe, thousands of years from now, they're not going to be able to know what was going on here, but they're going to see all these windmills, and it's going to make very little sense as to why such an advanced civilization that seems to have had pretty advanced things was making all these giant windmills. And if they had the ability to produce these gigantic windmills, like wouldn't they just make actual normal engines that could run things? It's going to be pretty confusing for people digging in, in our remains because the windmills are going to be everywhere and they're not going to biodegrade. They're just going to fall apart and stay in the ground and future historians are going to have a field day pontificating about what the hell those people were doing with all those stupid windmills <laughs> yeah at least like when you look at the the roman aqueducts like you, you you understand that they had a purpose there was there was a really value driven project that they had built like whereas these it just seems like it's just misallocated capital left right and center just a an era of just money being so freely available that it was just 
flooding all of these stupid projects and now it's inflated and i think it's going to come crashing down in a very interesting way i, I it's it's not going to be pretty for a lot of the the no, absolutely. In, these large wind and solar investments that that aren't yeah, yeah they aren't, aren't going to be economic but then yeah they they disrupts like the base load generators as well because when you have all these credits and incentives for generating electricity with windmills and solar panels you can bid super low costs into the markets and then that pushes your base load generators to not be able they don't get first priority to sell electricity into the grid so when you when you have that somebody's going to have to curtail somewhere and then you've got your grid managers in between that often they'll have to like call on a peaker plant to, to fire up because a field of solar panels just got covered by a cloud and it has to be readily available and you can't just you can't just shut down and decommission all of your natural gas plants because they need to be available. And even if they're running at a 30% capacity factor, they need to be available to back up the power when the wind and solar aren't generating. And they're often typically the highest cost uh, producer on your, your stack of generators because you're basically paying them to stay offline for a substantial part of the year and only come on when, when they're needed during extreme circumstances like like the, the heat waves that we're having when it gets cold here in like Ontario, it's, but it just seems more and more like they are having to turn to those like grid based strategies to shift like people's like the supply and demand based on like incentivizing people in their consumption and based in, in like different industries and in their consumption when now like that's the beautiful thing about the bitcoin mining is that we can just let everybody operate at 100 percent and they can maximize their revenue and i think the big winners in the energy sector is whoever can generate the most hash rate while also be able to provide like a value to the lo their local communities because you will be able to use it as mul in multiple different ways because it provides like a large base load anchor it provides a flexible anchor or even if it's just they just need a small amount where there's a, just that margin between supply and demand depending on like the seasonal differences and daily differences yeah the syllabus for my new online economics course principles of economics is now available on safedean.com the course will take place over 18 lectures each based on one chapter from my new book principles of economics which will be available for free as an ebook for everyone registering for the course Lectures will be released once every two weeks on Mondays, starting on the 25th of September, 2023, and will be available in video and audio format. Live discussion seminars will be held once a week on Thursdays at alternating time slots, 12 hours apart, to ensure learners can attend from all over the world. To enroll, sign up for a membership on safedean.com and receive a 20% discount if you sign up before the 20th of September. I want to get into Bitcoin mining and nuclear in a bit, but I still want to get your opinion on one other point when it comes to nuclear hysteria, which is the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings. So these are usually, you know, when you say nuclear in most people's mind, you know, people who watch TV don't really think things through. They just go through impressions and the impressions have been planted in their head through TV. So when you tell people uh, Bitcoin, for instance, they just think money laundry, criminals, uh, crazy libertarians, you know, they're, they're boiling the oceans, you know, it's just uh, propaganda. That's the way that it works. You keep repeating something, you keep associating something with the other. So for instance, for the majority of people, when they hear about oil and gas, they just think climate change, the weather is going bad, the floods, uh, blah, blah, whatever. Uh, there's, uh, there, you know, you, you can't sit somebody down and tell them, okay, Show me exactly the causal mechanism that goes from you switching your car on to flooding happening in Pakistan or droughts in Australia or whatever. And uh, they're not capable of doing that, but you know they watch propaganda, so they're conditioned to think of it. And similarly with nuclear energy, with most people, you know, there's Chernobyl and there's also Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And uh, you know, there's this idea that this was the most absolutely catastrophic bombing in human history. But in reality, Nagasaki and Hiroshima were not devastated much more than the rest of Japan. So, you know, the rest of Japan was bombed with conventional weapons, and that was pretty bad. And most people's minds, you know, it's uh, there was, you know, regular weapons were just like throwing a little bit of fireworks that killed a few people, and then you nuked Hiroshima and Nagasaki and destroyed them. But that's not 
entirely true. In fact, a lot more Japanese cities were more devastated than Hiroshima and Nagasaki than, than Hiroshima and Nagasaki with conventional bombing. Uh, Dresden, for instance, was far more devastated as a city than uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki with conventional weapons. So it does seem to me that there has perhaps been a deliberate effort to overplay the lethality of nuclear weapons. And perhaps that was driven by geopolitics. In a sense, you know, the U.S. government wanted to scare the world and said, look, we've developed this new weapon that can just wipe out humanity. If we, so if you mess with us, we can wipe out uh, the earth. We can kill all life on earth. Uh, we can destroy all life. And it does not seem to be the case. You know, you bombed a couple of small Japanese, medium-sized Japanese cities that weren't even entirely destroyed. And I think the most interesting thing here is that they recovered pretty quickly. I mean, by 1960, 1970, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were uh, better places to live in than most American cities, which were devastated by uh, all kinds of other manners of destroying cities, which seem to be far more sustainable as a way of destroying cities. You know, like you look at a place like Detroit today, you know, or uh, San Francisco or LA, uh, you know, you didn't need to nuke these places, but they, they are suffering much worse than Hiroshima and Nagasaki are. So it doesn't seem like the radiation from the nuclear bombs has been so devastating. And it does not look like the bomb itself is that destructive. So this idea that you could destroy the planet, to me, seems absurd with nuclear weapons. I have a friend who's a nuclear engineer and an Austrian economist, Rahim Tagazadeh Khan. Uh, he's a physicist. Um, I don't think he's a nuclear engineer. I think he's, he's studied nuclear physics and Austrian economics. He's been on the podcast here before. And he says that in his estimation, if you combined all of the world's nuclear arsenals, you know, all of the world's nuclear weapons, and if you threw them, uh, you would be able to destroy an area the size of Greece, which, you know, you could destroy Greece uh, with a lot of other weapons, not just the nuclear bomb. And so the idea that you could destroy the earth with nuclear bombs, I think seems extremely outlandish to me. And the idea that it is this uh, extremely powerful weapon does not so seem to be entirely convincing what do you think of that yeah well shock and awe is definitely an effective way to imprint ideas like the nuclear power is is very dangerous even compared to other weapons like that mushroom cloud definitely imprints itself into people's minds whenever they've they've seen it but like like you said like it was just a large it, it had was equivalent to just a large it, conventional bomb and the radiation actually like burns off quite quite quickly from a nuclear detonation and, and yeah like Hiroshima and Nagasaki they're now sprawling metropolises that, yeah that are doing quite well these days and it's I think it's just we've told ourselves a story and we've got this narrative that we've just kind of adhered to with a few assumptions baked into it that that don't often get revisited they just become a dogmatic belief that just nuclear weapons it equals world ending if it if they're ever unleashed so then we we just put them in the box and then they're there to intimidate when the need comes if if the sabers need rattling in any which way as we've seen a few times during the recent uh, conflict in ukraine like it's everyone gets worried it's just like oh if we provoke putin he might he might use nukes it's like i don't like the the guy he's he's not the nicest guy but he's not stupid and it, yeah, like that war zone, I yeah, I try not to get too much into that, but I I have empathy for the civilians and the poor conscripted soldiers that are just getting put through the meat grinder, and it would be nice for that to get put to an end. But Absolutely. it just seems like the forces want to continue. They're they're given just enough weapons to keep it continuing going, and then that has second order effects of disrupting well, the energy environment in in Europe, and everyone's scrambling to to get their national energy security strategies in order a lot of them are going towards nuclear power we're seeing even though with germany's providing a, a example for the world as to uh, what not to do as they scramble back towards building a lot more natural gas and coal infrastructure to ensure that they keep the lights on which then has a further effect of disrupting the global markets for coal and natural gas that many of the developing nations had depended on and now germany because they just have unlimited capital basically they can bid up the value of these commodities on the global markets, making it more costly for developing nations to afford the energy 
resources that they require to keep the lights on. And then like another example we've seen recently in uh, Japan over the last 10 years, like when they turned the, their nuclear reactors off, it had a significant effect, first of all, in the uranium markets. And it just dropped the value, the price of uranium to almost nothing because there was now a glut of it available on the market. And then that in turn had America started doing less processing and became more dependent upon other na other nations for importing their uranium. And, and then now your Japan is starting to ramp up their nuclear power fleet again. So now there's a beginning to be a much higher demand for uranium. And now that Russia is being treated as, as, as a, a shunned state, they, everyone's scrambling to find new means to get uranium enrichment resources available. So America has a few companies that they're basically putting to the task of developing the, the, uh, what is it? The Haley, Haley U enriched uh, uranium that predominantly came from Russia. There's efforts to make sure that a lot of the Russian made reactors that are in Europe are going to be able to retain fuel, even if they're not using the Russian fuel supply chains. And then at the same time, like uh, in Canada, we're ramping up our, our uranium extraction from our mines in Saskatchewan. The only thing that Canada doesn't do in relation to uranium is enrichment. So that has to be done by either the French, the Japanese, the Russians, or the Americans, whoever's involved in those markets at the time. And yeah, like with Japan, what I was jumped over is when they turned off that reactor fleet, then they switched over to predominantly importing natural gas. And for a brief period of time, the cost of natural gas was really low, but then there would be periods where the cost of natural gas was going really high. And then for an aging population in the winter, when you're starting to get put in a position between choosing whether to heat your home or keep your lights on or pay your rent, then uh, yeah, we started to see a lot of elderly people like dying in their homes in the cold because they chose to keep their thermostat at 15 degrees instead of 17 degrees, just because they can't afford the cost of, of heating them, their homes, which was not an issue when Japan was predominantly powered by nuclear power. And so now that that is turning around and they're rapidly getting that fleet back online, they're seeing a lot of that stress being alleviated off of their, their like elder demographics and their, yeah, they. I think they've still got like 12, 13 left to turn online over the next four years. But they're they're uh, doing everything they can to prepare to do so. They're bringing their fuel infrastructure back online, their enrichment infrastructure back online. They've got, I believe, Japan also has one of the breeder reactors that it can be fueled with reprocessed and recycled fuel from the the conventional boiled water reactors, and then it can ex can further reduce the nucleides that are available in that uh, that fuel so that the footprint of waste and byproducts at the end is actually even less harmful nucleides that need to be managed and stored for in yeah. indefinite long-term storage. Well, do you think, I mean, generally here we're massive fans of hydrocarbon fuels. I love oil, gas, and coal. And, Does they work? Um, yeah, they work, and they're much better than darkness. Um, and cold and freezing through the winter. But um, it pains me to say this, but do you think maybe it was the oil industry that had a hand in promoting uh, nuclear hysteria, radiation hysteria, nuclear bomb hysteria, trying to scare people out of this, to scare people out of building nuclear reactors because they were worried that that would eat up their uh, share of the industry? Do you have thoughts on that? That is definitely a prevailing narrative. The, the, it is heard often. Like I don't know how much there is to it, but it really wouldn't surprise me. Like they, they're they're good at keeping everything compartmentalized and using shell companies to support any of their like activism efforts, so that it doesn't get directly tied to any of them. Like that's pretty standard operating procedure for these big mon monopolistic companies and institutions. Yeah, really doesn't surprise me because. Yeah, nuclear is going to take a large share of the electrical infrastructure in the coming years. And then there's even some reactors that will be able to enter into heating markets as well. The ones that operate at higher, like six, seven, eight hundred degrees Celsius. Like there's still heat applications like that will not be able to be reached by nuclear power. Like when we start getting up over a thousand, the 1400, but even then you can use the electricity to run uh, induction furnaces. So there's there's alternative ways to do that, but it, it's still the most efficient way to get those temperatures is like coked coal is, is predominantly what you're gonna use for making steel and glass at those very high temperatures. But there's still a ton of market 
below those temperatures, you got like textiles, pharmaceuticals, uh, agriculture chemicals, distilleries, greenhouses. Yeah, there's, there's countless industries that can use that heat. Yeah, and I think that the hydrocarbons are just so pervasive in all of our life everywhere that even if we were to drastically reduce the amount of them that we consume for energy, that would still, you know, still wouldn't kill the industries because we need them for so many other things. We need plastics. We need all these products that we make from hydrocarbons, which our lives would be completely unrecognizable without people like to virtue signal a lot about you know oil free this and oil free that but all of these idiots protesting oil and protesting hydrocarbons you know their banners are made out of oil all these morons who glue themselves to um to, to highways or to to paintings or to museums or whatever they're using <laughs> hydrocarbons to make that glue you would not be able to make your stupid protest work if you didn't have hydrocarbons so um, the the biggest compliment that you could pay hydrocarbons is that you can't protest hydrocarbons without hydrocarbons. So we're not running away from them. So if no, you know, if they're just going to lose a little market. Yeah, I mean, if, if if anybody in the oil and gas industry is listening, you know, uh, you don't need to <laughs> go this far. We're 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 going to still consume all of your products, but also. I mean, even in energy, we're nowhere near the technological point where we could have micro nuclear reactors that, you know, can power your car, you know, a tiny little nuclear reactor in the car. I don't think that that's um, been done yet. And I think it's going to be a while before somebody is able to figure it out. So for all transportation uses, it's highly likely that we're going to continue to use a lot of hydrocarbons. And as you said, for high heat, then it seems like hydrocarbons are going to continue. So, and and of course, because of all the built infrastructure out there, there are there are power plants being built for coal, gas, and oil today that have a 50, 60, 70 year life expectancy. They're going to keep uh, consuming the, their, these fuels for decades to come, no matter what happens with nuclear. And again, you know, from an economic perspective, we don't just shut down on the less uh, efficient resource. We're going to continue to be using it, even as we use more and more of the other one, because there's no limit on how much energy we can use. The more energy we have, the better our life becomes, the more things we can afford. We will we'll displace it to higher order uses. Like instead of using natural gas for electricity generation, we'll use it for producing higher order chemicals and fertilizer and stuff like that. Or Yeah. Like, and these things nuclear can never replace. No, like nuclear, the power that nuclear generates can be used as as a power source to to produce these chemicals and to create this these value added uh, operations but it yeah you're you're never going to replace certain th products and commodities that are made available by hydrocarbons it's it's an it's an impossible feat and it it seems silly and one of the funniest things about it is all of these nations like like even Canada and like parts of America where their demand for natural gas and coal and oil hasn't changed and in fact in many cases has increased but their domestic production of it is decreasing significantly so instead of producing it in your own nation like in western first world nations that have high labor standards high environmental standards where you can actually have some sort of regulatory control over it no we're just going to import it from ecuador and venezuela where there's 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 like no standards for labor and and, and environment but yet we're still going to be using the same amount. So all you're doing is just exporting the process of doing it so that you can feel good about yourselves to say that you shut down and basically ca kneecapped the, the Canadian oil and gas in industry. But then, yeah, you just import from South America or the Middle East, and wherever you, the, the market brings it from that have the questionable standards. So it's it's a weird game. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, performative hypocrisy is really the <laughs> national sport of much of the Western world today. And uh, energy is the place where you see this in all its glory, whether it's, you know, using enormous quantities of hydrocarbons in order to build uh, solar panels and windmills that then require hydrocarbon backup energy to keep them which in total will cost several multiples of what nuclear power costs and then importing the nuclear fuel from abroad. All of it is just ridiculous non-economic decisions, all motivated by very childish and very, very transparently silly motivations. You know, this will fix the weather and this will make us better able to 
resist having droughts or whatever. That's completely nonsensical. If you want to resist nature's wrath, if you want to resist the climate changing, if you want to resist flooding, droughts, you need energy. That's the only reason we're able to survive in very hot places because we have air conditioning. That's how we can drain swamps. That's how we can build dikes. It's, it's, it's all down to energy. That's what we do. We take energy and we make better things with it so that we can be lazier and move on to the next thing. Exactly. We always and, just try to make our lives easier. Yeah, engineering is just applied laziness, as I like to call it. Uh, it's just, you know, why walk when you can invent a car? Because yeah, like in the whole market too with, with nuclear power, because of America kind of had like ran roughshod over the world for, for many decades, even countries like Saudi Arabia that, that have shown an interest in wanting to get nuclear power have been denied it because they also wanted to have some control over their domestic fuel management of, of uranium. But because the US was so paranoid about every anybody and everybody wanting to make nuclear weapons that they were ensuring that you, you would have to import the fuel that would be processed and developed somewhere else. No, you were not allowed to have your own capabilities. So that resulted in Saudi Arabia never getting nuclear power. And now Saudi Arabia is looking at China as a potential place, a vendor to get nuclear power from. And then like right now, after the successful uh, construction of the Baraka reactors in the United Arab Emirates, all, there are a lot of customers lining up for South Korea to build nuclear reactors. Like uh, Poland's on that list. I think there might be one or two other Middle Eastern countries. I know there's a few African countries that are in discussions with South Korea. Like there's a lot of fans out there of that APR 1400 that, that was built and designed. And now that they've got a successful like supply chain, they, they can they can just start building these things probably one every few years after getting that four pack completed for the UAE. And they've already requested that they want two more. And then like, who else on top of that? Like all throughout Europe, they're looking into small modular reactors. They're looking into the various uh, various types, like the Rosatom still is building some of the, the VVER 1000 reactors that they are very familiar with. So there's customers that are continuing to, to order that reactor despite yeah, they, they don't really take much interest in sides in this war. They just want a good, reliable power unit that they can uh, provide in their country. Because, like, yeah, that's why, like, Turkey, Hungary, Bangladesh, and Egypt are right now working with Rosatom. And then who else is in play right now? Because there's South America or South Africa. I think they were talking with somebody about building a new one. But there's so much going on right now in this state. Like every other week, there's a there's a new announcement that I can barely keep up with it. Like Ontario announced that they want to add another five gigawatts to the Bruce reactor facility, which will bring it up from just over 10 gigawatts to 15 gigawatts. Like even Quebec, as who shut down the reactor 10 years ago, is talking about reigniting and um, refurbishing one of their reactors because what it seems like they did, they had a very good, reliable, abundant hydroelectric power system. So they began exporting a lot of that in the recent decade or so. And then that came to the point where New Hampshire shut down a nuclear reactor, New York shut down a nuclear reactor, and then there's all of this power infrastructure shutting down in these bordering states to Quebec. And now it's getting to the point where there isn't enough of that excess electricity to go around for everybody that now became just like, oh, well, we'll just import it from this this place that has a lot of it. Well, like eventually you you spread yourself thin when everybody wants a piece of that action. So now they're reversing course on their decision to shut down their nuclear reactors. And then out in New Brunswick, we have an existing Candu reactor out there and they want to build a the Moltex waste burner reactor. That's the, the fun nickname they have for it because it's essentially going to be fed by recycled nuclear fuel and that's going to be its primary fuel. So it's just going to consume the byproducts from the rest of the can-do fleet and the rest of the uh, the BWR and PWR fleets. And then there's another one that they want to build. There's a large port in northern New Brunswick that's operated with a large, I think it's like a 1.2 gigawatt coal plant right now that is, it is approaching like the end of its life within the next decade or so. So they're really looking into replacing that with nuclear. So they want to build that into a large clean energy industrial park where it's going to be primarily powered by the nuclear power. It's going to have the, the mass production facility to build that nuclear reactor and then export it to other markets and then also do other uh, value-added uh, processes like uh, ammonia desalination and other 
chemicals because it can be exported onto the international markets because yeah new brunswick's got a good port system to to export from if we have the infrastructure and the industries there to do so so like there is a ton of action going on in this industry right now and it it's very enthusiastic and there's a lot of moving parts right now and there is a lot of fud coming out of the work woodwork from the anti-nuclear side because they've lost a lot of wind in their sails and they're pissed off that every dollar that doesn't that is going towards nuclear power is money that they see as not going towards their preferred project swings and slides as i like to call them (laughs) so um, could you make the case for anti-nuclear energy if you were um, you know, what What would be your steel manning of the case against nuclear weapons? If you wanted to, if, if you were paid to do a job where you have to go and argue against nuclear energy, against licensing it, against making it happen, against uh, regulating it, and just a ban on all kind of nuclear energy, what would be your case for it? That is a tough one because I have been so obsessed with with being on the affirmative side of that yeah Yeah, but i mean you've heard the other arguments so what are the yeah because the other arguments are are essentially it costs too much it's too slow to build what do we do with the waste and weapons like those are the four primary sticking points on nuclear power yeah so dangerous and weapons we've I, I'd say we kind of went over that uh, at the beginning of the uh, discussion like, long enough. Yeah, like for weapons, like there's a shared like origin because they both use uranium, so they both mine uranium. But like, yeah, once once the uranium enters the different supply chains, it's a completely different structure. If it, whether it goes to power or weapons, and then there's there's legacy from mining, like with the what is it the the Navajo Nation has a a lot of legacy uranium mines from during the cold war when there was a race to obtain as much uranium as possible to build the weapons so that kind of gets put on the industry as a whole to kind of atone for in some way to at least like at least the very least like help them move past and and clean it up and and make up for accidents of the past but not rather than ignore them because that seems to be one of the historical things that gets gets poked on is this like yes, there is legacy issues with the industry, and there's there's been things learned along the way, but you can't just ignore them and hope that they'll go away because there will always be that contingent of of anti nuclear people that are like, well, what about this thing that you did in the past and that thing that you did in the past? Like, there has to be some way to to move past them in in a collaborative way that every that everybody party involved can come away with satisfied with the outcome. Yeah, and what about the costs? So, yeah, I mean, I think. For, for the way that I see it, the vast majority of costs are probably due to overregulation and um, interest. Interest, yeah, because it's a very long it's, it's a very long payback on the project, right? Yeah, when you're investing in a forty year long payback period, you yeah, the difference between the three percent interest rate and like a nine percent interest rate can be tens of billions of dollars. And that's that's one of the things that inflated the cost of uh, what is it the Hinkley Point C reactor they're building in the UK. If you look at a pie graph of the cost breakdown, two thirds of it alone is just interest on a twenty billion dollar project. So that's twelve billion dollars is purely to the interest on that project, which is insane. But that it was because nuclear was relocated to the high risk, controversial categories where you would have to go out on that on that end of the interest curve to actually invest in these projects while competitive projects have been getting like subsidies tax credits and then super low interest rates for the last decade so it's been this weird thing where they they're like oh yes wind and solar is really cheap but if it was treated at at the same fairness on like the capital cost investment then people would lean towards nuclear power like every day of the week because overall it would cost a lot less per megawatt generated and then when you get nuclear power generating like a gigawatt of nuclear power is not the same as a gigawatt of solar power because it takes up different land volume you require different fuel amounts and you require redundancies for the solar power to operate when it's when it's not available so you're either going to need batteries you're going to need a gas power plant so so you're tripling or quadrupling your cost of your of of actually making it reliable so when you start taking in all of those factors of, of firming up the intermittent sources the the, the lcoe comparisons are 
pretty much on par with each other. But then one of the other benefits of nuclear power is you've got the jobs and they're very, very unionized organizations. Like you've got some, some of these reactors have been operating so long that you have like two, three, in some instances, four generations of families that have worked at the same facility from when it was built to when it was decommissioned. So like, that's not something that the wind and solar industry can boast because there are a lot of like fly by night kind of infrastructure projects where they just, they come in, they build it and then they just, they just walk away. And then that there is no like job benefit to the local community, except for like a, a small handful of, uh, of maintenance techs that would need to be available. But for a nuclear power reactor, even with employing several thousand people in, in for a unit of, of nuclear energy, they still competitive on the market for the cost of electricity that they generate. Yeah, I'm going to have to slightly disagree with you on this one. I think the good thing about energy sources is that they don't create jobs. I don't think of jobs as being a good thing. Jobs are essentially a cost. You know, uh, If we wanted jobs, we should go back to uh, manual slave labor. Like, we just have people uh, bike so that you could uh, turn on your light bulb. <laughs> and that's, that, that's going to generate a lot more jobs that way. Obviously, it's going to make us all dirt poor. But if you want jobs, you know, then destroying the quality of life is the way to go. So the way technology advances is that we find ways that allow us to do more with less uh, work. But no, you're absolutely correct on the differences in cost. And I think the, the the absurd thing, you mentioned this earlier, which is that they always tout batteries as the solution. Well, yeah, well, we're building wind and solar right now, but, you know, battery technology is going to improve. And I've I've been hearing about batteries being around the corner and they're going to be good enough uh, for decades, and they're just not, and they never will be. Well, I mean, never is a big word, but realistically, at as it stands, the cost of getting energy out of a battery is about tenfold, maybe a hundredfold of getting it directly from an energy source. So an energy source that generates energy, like burning a fuel, is infinitely usually cheaper than taking that same energy, putting it in a battery, and then taking it out of the battery. It's just a lot more expensive, and it only makes sense in places where you can't really have an engine. Even electric cars, um, they don't make economic sense without subsidies. If you take out the subsidies, the entire industry goes uh, away. And, and you know, people talk about batteries as if we're just around the corner. Realistically, though, uh, you look at all the batteries in the place like the UK, they're enough to power the UK for, I forget exactly how much, but it's something in the seconds. So there's enough batteries in the UK to run the electric grid of the UK for five seconds, 10 seconds, something like that. That's basically it. That's all the batteries that are in the UK if you, if, if you use them. So in order to be able to make batteries run so that you could run for several days on end when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining, and of course in England, <laughs> you know, they don't have any sun. Well, they do have some sun, but they have very little sun and they're still building solar power. <laughs> and... No, I love I love the idea of, of, of we're worried that the weather is going to be changing so dramatically that we're going to become dependent upon it. That just yes. It does not make much sense to me. Yeah, performative hypocrisy, as I mentioned. It's just uh, absolutely amazing. We're so worried about the weather that we're going to make all of our modern infrastructure reliant on it. Like you, We need to read the weather forecast in order to decide when you can do your laundry and when you can turn on the lights and whether you are able to work uh, after dark today or not. It's completely absurd. Yeah, well, I've I've heard read some proposals like some of these hundred percent wind and solar in, on renewables only proposals, and to make it work, like yeah, they're going to need enough battery capacity to last for like thirty days for it to even provide the reliability that's going to be required, and that inflates the cost to such an obscene amount that. Yeah, I I don't know how people take those ideas seriously, but there's there's a few out there that that is kind of their belief system that they have rallied around that that is actually a real possibility to do it without nuclear and without fossil fuels whatsoever unfortunately it's not a few i i believe it's the vast majority of people if you ask your average tv consumer tv or university consumer which is basically the same thing at these days they they'll tell you you know it's it's a sad thing that we still need to use hydrocarbons i know that i use hydrocarbons i wish i couldn't 
But, you know, the future is that we're moving away from hydrocarbons to wind and solar. And it's just completely ridiculous because that's not the future. That's the past. That's seventh century technology. Going back to relying on the wind and the sun is what your ancestors 500 years ago did. Over the past 500 years, we've found better ways. We've found fuels, which we could just ignite whenever we want and have the energy at our fingertips, do what we want when we want it. That's what really matters. And, and this is a key point that I keep making in, that I make in principles of economics, which is, you know, in economics, we do marginal analysis. You make economic decisions at the margin. Economic decisions ha- pertain to what you're going to be doing about the next unit. And so with energy, People think that it's some kind of competition over who can muster a larger amount of energy. So, well, the sun is very big, so obviously the sun wins because it's a lot of energy. And the sun is free, so obviously the sun is going to beat out everything else. And just that's just economically illiterate nonsense because in reality, it's not about how much energy you have in total. Just like, you know, remember the example of the water and diamond paradox, which I discuss in chapter one of Principles of Economics uh, to explain marginal analysis. And you can see chapter one on my website, Principles of Economics page, which is safety.com slash POE. But in the same way that, you know, diamonds are more expensive than water because people make decisions at the margin, you never have to decide between all of the world's water and all of the world's diamonds. You're always in a situation, usually for most of your life, where you're surrounded by plentiful water and the next unit of water is not that important to you, whereas you have very few diamonds and the next unit of diamond is pretty significant. So that's what makes diamonds more expensive. If I put you in an island with no water and a lot of diamonds, diamonds would be worth nothing for you compared to water because you'd need to survive. So similarly with energy, it completely doesn't matter ever if uh, what's more abundant or what exists in higher quantities and what the cost is in aggregate. What matters is at the margin when it's dark and cold and you need to turn on the heat. What can you click a switch and have? And at that point, solar energy is infinite. The cost of solar energy at that point is infinite. You could have the richest person in the world dedicate all of the money that they want. They can't make the sun shine if they need it. So the cost of solar energy is infinite at the margin when you need it. The cost of wind is infinite when the wind isn't blowing. And that's why at the margin, they are completely unworkable. And as an economic choice, Nobody would ever invest in these uh, silly forms of energy if it was a free market. You know, people people watch TV and repeat the noises that the TV tells them. You know, we like wind and solar and we don't like coal and gas. But in reality, with your money, when your kids are cold in the winter, you're not going to spend your money on buying another windmill and another solar panel. You're going to spend your money on a furnace that can keep them warm. But that's that's the difference between economic decision-making versus, as I was calling it earlier, performative hypocrisy. Well, it's like, yeah, even if you, you own like an off-grid property and you have solar panels, you're still going to have a generator. Like you're, you're never going to leave yourself in a situation where you do not have what you need to keep the lights on and the temperature warm in your home. Like, it it does seem that there there is a growing contingent of they they call themselves enviro, env- environmental realists is what they're kind of going by it's people that have they buy in to the, the climate change narrative but they're they disavow the 100% wind and solar narrative and they're like if we're going to take this seriously like nuclear has to be part of part of the role so it is weird talking to some of the people that that don't take nuclear seriously as like they they believe wholeheartedly that the apocalypse is is is, is a foregone conclusion. Like where, however you want to read the IPCC reports and read like their most their most like out there possible scenarios and read that as a foregone conclusion and then base your present day behavior off of that conclusion that the world is inevitably doomed because of, of carbon. They don't seem to take this the problem that they're advocating for seriously if they don't see the value in that nuclear power plays in actually solving the problem that they're trying to solve. So it is very backwards and confusing to me that that they want to save us from an impending climate doom, but are de- denying the 
possibility of using probably our most effective tool at making ourselves so resilient to whatever mother nature determines to throw at us that we will just shrug it off and keep moving on because that's what humanity does like reliance and resilience to nature is how we move forward not putting ourselves into an economy where things are become just enough and like yeah if you, you you don't have enough electricity available right now so you're going to have to shift the time that you use it or if you don't have credits or if you if they we get into this cbdc stuff where they can be telling us that we've consumed too much electricity or too much fuel at any given time and then just cut you off based on some arbitrary central planners decision on how the economy should be run like i think that is a very dangerous path to be going down but there are actually serious people out there that believe that we can change the weather and we can save the world from the impending climate doom but all we have to do is cede all authoritative decision making to people that believe just like them and then everything will be okay but as we've seen many times throughout history that uh that's a recipe for shit to go sideways. Yes. Um, I've summarized climate science before. You know, I've, I, I, I did my PhD in this uh, topic. Uh, obviously, I don't claim any expertise based on the PhD, but uh, having spent quite a bit of time thinking about this and you having been part of the church of people who believed in the idea that carbon dioxide is the control knob of the temperature of the earth and that it can... Uh, it's what's going to determine everything. I think I've come to a, uh, you can summarize all of modern climate science with one sentence, basically. And that is everything that socialists like makes the weather good. Everything that socialists hate makes the weather bad. It's very simple. And so if you want good weather, just agree to global socialism and communism. Then you'll get the best weather in the world. It's a perfect scapegoat. It works out because it can be used for everything. Oh, Oh, there was a fire. Must have been climate change. And then yeah. two weeks later, two weeks later, oh, we found out. Oh, it was that was that was definitely arson. But the narrative's already been seeded. There's already been like policymakers already banging the drums, just like, oh, we have to, we need more authority to make these decisions so that we can prevent this from happening again. But then you start digging into, okay, well, let's go back through the decisions that led to the fires starting to begin with, and you start to see that funding was being diverted from forestry management from keeping the grass from growing long and drying out near power lines and just creating this powder keg that was just waiting for the right provocation and then in some cases yeah it was it may have probably nature like lightning strikes happen all the time start fires but the fact that any of these fires have been started by arsonists is very concerning and it throws the credibility of just jumping to the conclusion that every fire is related to climate change in completely on its head. Like it, it, it almost feels like there's, it's like the protection racket strategy. It's just like, if you don't give us what we want, we're going to cause trouble for you. And, and now we're seeing it. Yeah. And even whether it is arson or not, ultimately there is nothing new under the sun. I mean, this is people who have been around on earth for 30 years think that what we've seen over the last three years is just completely different from everything that we've seen before. And it isn't, we've had wildfires before. In fact, wildfires used to be far more devastating than what they are now. We've had everything. We've had rain, we've had droughts, we've had floods, we've had all of these weather phenomena. They've always existed. We had trees growing in the Arctic. If you dig in the Arctic, there are places today where trees don't grow. But sometime in the past, it used to be warm enough that trees could grow there. The Thames River in London used to be frozen over during winter. That it used to happen all the time that it would freeze in the winter. Now it doesn't freeze. So we know that there's just this natural variation in the Earth's temperatures that can happen without any input from humanity, before any industrialization, before anything that we could do uh, could affect the temperature. We had this enormous variation where trees could grow in the Arctic and the Thames River could freeze, and we had nothing to do with it. So why is it that all of the stuff that is happening now is all of our fault? And why is it that the people who are telling you that have no other solution for it except giving them complete control over your consumption of energy, which is essentially complete control over all of your life? Yeah, it's a weird, weird world we found ourselves in these days, like, like, even if carbon does have an effect on the climate, like I would rank it after like the sun, the moon, the oceans, the core, the volcanoes, the atmosphere, like there's a long list of natural forces that, that, 
do their own thing that we barely understand and how they relate to each other in this complex environment that they work within. But then we just assume that this singular variable, if we just tinker with this singular variable, that will solve all of the problems. But then that becomes, yeah, when you become hyper-focused on one variable at the at the cost of, of everything else around it, then you start to make poor decisions on your strategies, how to do that. Like some of these calls for reducing fossil fuels and, and hydrocarbon-based cars completely by 2030, 2035, like... I don't know how many people that's going to like sacrifice to the altar of this belief system, but I, I can expect that it's going to be substantial if we do head in that direction. Like I'm very concerned for a future where we have states like Germany and like in America, that are having trouble keeping their lights on consistently. Like, like you, you're, you're familiar with like Lebanon. So like, you, you know what that's like, and that's coming to all kinds of Western nations that that is, that is not something that they're accustomed to, and they're not going to adapt well to it. I know, and it's 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 absolutely mind blowing for me. You know, having seen the grid deteriorate in Lebanon and seen how things um, continue to get worse and worse, it's 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 amazing to me to see people in places like California and Texas begin to normalize the idea that look, you can you can't just expect to have 24 hour electricity all the time. You know, you have to follow the commands of your dear leader governor who gets on TV and tells you whether it's okay to turn on your AC or not. You have to turn on the AC during the times when there's no peak demand and then hope that the house stays cool during the time when peak demand is on and you need to turn off the AC. And it's just, once you've moved to this life where your actions are dependent on what happens to the electricity that goes into your house. You are in for a world of pain because number one, it's going to massively, massively destroy your productivity. And I speak from personal experience. I remember just how, how e even if you're just working from a laptop, you know, and even if you're just sitting there working from a laptop, and you think, well, the laptop has a battery, so even if the if, if the electricity goes out, then life goes on. It's a lot more complicated than that. When the electricity starts going out and when you start needing to structure your life around the availability of the electricity, it's an enormous drain on your productivity and it makes modern productivity, modern life, modern uh, high productivity workers, you know, people who take this for granted. It's just you walk into an office, there's always electricity, everything works. You just click the button and you get whatever you want. If you can't have everything working seamlessly, then your productivity is out of the is, is is going to go down the drain. And secondly, this doesn't get better. If you're started down that path, it's only going to continue to get worse and worse and worse. And you see this, you know, every summer and every winter, you see these things happening in Texas and in California. And it's just that they're normalizing it. You know, the, the initially they're used to, people used to get angry and say, I can't believe the electricity's out. Well, now people are very proud and very happy about the governor who told them, you know, told everybody to shut down their air conditioning at a certain point, and therefore the grid didn't fail. And so we're very proud of ourselves. And next year, we're going to do even more rationing. Yeah, we all came together for the collective good. Exactly. Like, like I've actually, yeah, I've seen people on Twitter bragging about their pre-cooling strategies of how they actually, they know when the power is going to go out. So they, they'll crank up their air conditioning and lower their house temperature to like 15 so that it can slowly come up to 23, 24 when they don't have power to bring it back down. Like that's, that's insane. But that's only viable in the first period of dysfunction, you know, having gone through the death of a grid. It's only in the first period where you're able to know when your power is going to be out. But if you've gotten there, you're already on a slippery slope, which is going to take you down to a point where you don't know where the electricity comes along. And now you see people in places like Lebanon, you know, their entire life is just revolving around those few hours a day when you're going to get electricity. That's when you need to make sure your phone is charged. You need to make sure that you take the elevator. So you go, you get all the groceries from the car and you put them in the elevator and you take the elevator up to your house. Everything in your life revolves around these few hours. And that's the next stage that you can look forward to. If well, like, how, yeah, how do you even like keep food and stuff? Like, you, you'd be you'd be yelling at the kids to not open the freezer all the time because you got to keep it cold. <laughs> like, it's 
if if you can even have a freezer. Yeah, well, one thing they do is they got these batteries which will charge from the electricity, and then you use it to keep the refrigerator running. And then you know, if you're richer, then you can buy the bigger battery that you can use for having more of the infrastructure of the house running and so on. But it's just the the fact that you uninventing the grid. That's the real tragedy of it. Like you had this thing where you just had one cable go into your house and give you all the energy you want. On, on demand whenever you want it you know it doesn't matter if it's cold or rainy or hot and now everything is there and now you have to actively manage it and that's just such a massive step backward to your productivity to your peace as a human being when you have to live your life every day managing you know ooh, oh i should switch on this thing so that i could keep the refrigerator running because if, if i don't that the food is going to go bad and i need to make sure the air conditioning is running i need to make sure this thing is running and it's just a complete complete catastrophe mm-hmm. I, yeah. I, I I hope people reverse and really nuclear is the answer. But we got to talk about Bitcoin. Tell us about Bitcoin mining yes. on nuclear. What's the deal with that? I do love the idea of mining Bitcoin with nuclear. Like when I first started pushing and cheerleading for this idea, there was no examples of it whatsoever. It was just a, a bold idea that was kind of built off of seeing how the like upstream data was building the the hash huts to go on on the flare gas and then seeing that the guys doing similar things on uh, landfill sites and agricultural uh, off gassing and just finding all these stranded opportunities hydroelectric dams and then it just made sense to apply it to nuclear power because one of nuclear power's biggest liabilities is that sometimes there's too much power being generated and then you have to either curtail that or or pay somebody else to take it in the case of like Ontario does that fairly frequently when when our operating nuclear fleet was at full capacity before being partially shut down for refurbishments it was pretty routine to have as much as 20 terawatt hours just either curtailed or negatively priced from our grid which like even at five cents kilowatt hour that's a billion dollars on the table that's just being just pissed away into nothing when that could be going towards lowering the rates for taxpayers, rate payers, and in improving the infrastructure that the, the generators actually have to deal with and all the transmission infrastructure. So then it just, it made sense that if we want to build nuclear power and we want to be able to keep it on all the time, we need an anchor consumer that will always be available to, to consume that electricity that can be matched to any generation profile. Like right now, a lot of the talk is on hydrogen electrolysis and desalination as kind of the uh, the, the anchor loads that they want to use for these new nuclear, like the small modular reactor deployments and the generation for advanced reactors. And to some point, like they were, were, were good, but not nearly as good as Bitcoin mining because like hydrogen, for example, it will work good if you have a local market that can consume it or a means with which you can like package it and transport it and export it but if you're like in the middle of none of it making hydrogen is not going to make much sense but on the in the port of new brunswick making hydrogen makes a little more sense because then you can export it from there or use it locally for like steel manufacturing and whatnot or yeah upgrading it to better higher order chemicals and yeah so so that was the big liabilities there was too much electricity and Canada has this SMR action plan where we want to build small reactors in like the five megawatts range, 80 megawatt range, 120 megawatt range that apply to different markets that don't fit in to the large nuclear reactor markets where you're going to have sufficient demand. Like you need to have a city nearby with a large manufacturing base to justify that kind of power usage or, or lots of export markets nearby where it's from what I'm familiar with, a lot of European countries that have nuclear power, they have it on a border that shares like two or three different countries so that they can all share of the value of those those reactors. The idea is, is that during the various stages of life, because a nuclear reactor is very capital front loaded, it's very important to be able to generate and profit off of the output of a nuclear power reactor as much as possible from the moment that it's operational to the moment that it is decommissioned and there'll be the depending on what the reactors are being used for whether it's for an industrial process or a community you'll have different demand profiles that you'll have to contend with so that's another beautiful part about the bitcoin mining because you can just change it in chunks of three kilowatts a piece depending on how many asics you want or like there there are trade-offs but you could have different different uh, banks of ASICs with different efficiencies. So if you want to have a set that will turn off when your power price hits four cents, then you have your S9s go down. And then when you get up to 11 cents, then you, you'll you'll drop down your, your S19s to service the grid. And But 
the trade-off in that is that you you have more machines that you have to be taking maintenance of. So if you have all of the same machine, you, your maintenance requirements are going to be a little more straightforward with only being the same computer that needs to be taken care of. But it really depends on the operational strategy of the company that wants to employ this. So there can be different strategies with existing Bitcoin mining companies doing kind of what they're doing now and just getting purchase, power purchase agreements from grids that uh, have nuclear power on them. So Clean Spark is a good example of that one. They have a large presence in Georgia. Georgia has a large nuclear power output. Almost, I think it's like half of their grid is nuclear power and it's going to be even more once they finally have a Vogel 4 operational. So there's that example. And then there's the example of Terra Wolf and Talon Energy in Pennsylvania. That's the first example of a behind the meter uh, operation for the data center was built right on the site of the nuclear reactor. So they're using shared infrastructure there and there's room for expansion and building possibly like other data center types, more of the, the, the always on and always available time, not as flexible as the Bitcoin miners, but those ones also require redundancies to keep their uptimes on. So there's a, a different cost profile to your standard data centers than to a flexible data center that can tolerate downtime like a Bitcoin miner. So yeah, so as we're getting into these different models of how they can be scaled together and match different load profiles, then we can get into the different ways that they can service as a, like demand response. So they're always there to consume that excess electricity, no matter no matter what it is. So we, even because of that, we can build excess capacity and just fill in that space with the ASICs and just use them as a placeholder until whatever in, industrial uh, operation reaches maturity or the community grows into that new uh, generation profile that they have. And then because the miners are easily transportable and we're starting to see that there's a growing robust marketplace for ASICs and for hash rate, there's any number of different strategies that you can either, as the community grows into it and you don't need as many ASICs to fill that place, then you can, you can just move them to another facility that you yourself own or you sell them on the market. There's yeah, so there's going to be a number of different ways that you can handle that. Or the other option is, yeah, you can lower your amount of your hash rate or you can increase your power because the w beautiful thing about some of these small modular reactors is that they're going to be predominantly built in a large factory. And so they will be shipped to site almost completely assembled. And then it'll take only six months to a year to do the, the final on-site uh, commissioning of these reactors. So it'll be a lot lot quicker to get them stood up in different locations, depending on the future energy needs of these communities. So we can really build today what the future might need without the risk of leaving any of it stranded in the meantime. And then we can really get creative with these deployment scenarios. So like what, what they're working on right now, like without Bitcoin mining is they want to optimize how we can build mini grids that are completely separated from the major grids like um like just say a a conventional mine in northern canada up in like none of it somewhere that needs seven megawatts well the the argument is that well, you don't build two five megawatt reactor units because then you're going to leave three megawatts stranded so and then you're also going to need a heat element to it because the diesel generators also provide heat to a mining operation like that but the, what they want to do is they want to fill in the gap. Like right now, yeah, without Bitcoin mining, the ideal situation is is a windmill, a diesel generator, and a nuclear reactor, plus some batteries and thermal storage. And 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 to me, that just seems like a little overly complicated when now you can just put two reactors, fill in the space with the, the ASICs, and then you can fill in more of that space before the, the mine reaches maturity because it's not going to be at its full capacity right away. There'll be like a stage of two or three years where it's only using a fraction of that. And then you can scale down the miners when it reaches its peak. And then as it reaches it, the end of its life and scales down again, you can ramp back up your mining capacity to just, it just a way of just maximizing the efficiency of using these large like capital investments as of a nuclear reactor. The, the more consumers, the like miners included, that we can spread the capital costs across, the less it's going to cost everybody that is purchasing the electricity from that unit. And it's just going to be better for every community. It's, it's essentially like what I'm playing with is the the, the Brandon Quidham's pioneer species idea that we, we can just, we can plant seeds of the nuclear reactor with a contingency of ASICs wherever we need them, whether we need them today or we're going to need them in the future, even if they're not used 
right away. They can just sit there and they can just hash away. And then you can get into even crazier theories. You start thinking about like the ideas that Jason Lowry plays with that if, if, if a nation state's going to start hashing and other nation states are starting to hash, like how much hashing should a nation state be hashing if the other nation states are also hashing? Because then it becomes very competitive. We've already seen like uh, several countries that are mining at the state level, El Salvador being the first one. Then we heard about Bhutan using hydroelectric. Oman just came out this week saying that they're building a, a large 800 megawatt facility. The UAE has a uh, sovereign wealth fund that's partnered with Marathon that they're building a large Bitcoin mining facility to go along with their Baraka reactors. So there's a lot of interested parties that that straddle both of these lines between the Bitcoin mining and the nuclear power. Because even many of those African nations that had went and visited El Salvador shortly after uh, the, uh, the, the legal tender laws, many of those nations are also looking into getting their first foray into nuclear power, like... Uh, Ghana, Uganda, Nigeria, there's a bunch of the events going on in Niger and Mali right now are a little complicating to some of that stuff, but it does look like within a decade or so there will, there will be more African nations that have nuclear power. And I, I can foresee us using like the Bitcoin mining, they're already establishing with grid list different strategies on how they can implement like small scale energy infrastructure and use the Bitcoin mining as that anchor, like right down to just a, a few hundred kilowatts. But then so we, because of the nature of mining, like we can play around with anywhere from a few kilowatts to, to gigawatts. And anywhere in between and then seeing all the different crazy ways that like home miners are finding to reuse their heat. There was a guy on Vallis's podcast, dude, that does homesteading and he was talking about he uses an ASIC to evaporate the the, the liquids from his bio uh, digester toilet. He uses it to dehydrate a lot of his herbs and, and, and mushrooms and produce. He uses it just as a space heater. He uses it in, in his uh, rigged into his HVAC, he uses it rigged into his, his dryer, which which I also do. And it's an interesting bifurcation, just seeing all the different strategies at the small scale and then at the large scale, because it's like some of these houses are in places that have like large nuclear infrastructure. So it can gain a lot of value by having those low electricity rates and then mining at home. But it really depends on where you are. There's so many considerations for jurisdiction wise. There's so many considerations for for who you're working with whether you want to work with a third party or not, because it's only a matter of time before these energy companies start figuring out that they can just plug in these computers for themselves and they don't need a middleman that's already an established Bitcoin mining company. So I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of these established companies either either pivot to being like, have like at least a consulting firm that supports these large energy pro uh, assets to develop it for themselves or they will just be bought out by some of these energy companies and they'll just be like, like Exxon will just, just buy like upstream data. And there now we've got like a, a power company that, that has a, seg a section of their, or their company that mines Bitcoin and explores different ways that they can be getting into it. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see more of that coming out with uh, like the nuclear, like the next generation nuclear vendors, because there was that one with Oaklo and Compass, but I haven't heard much of that since Compass had, Compass had their complications with the uh, jurisdictional issues, placing ASICs in, in Russia and then getting rug pulled when the war started. So that that's just one of many different considerations that they have to, to think about playing these games, but that's, that's all it really seems to be. It's just, it's a game of who can generate the most power so that we can generate more hash rate and make this network even more resilient and more robust for the people that are using it and just keep feeding that feedback loop where if it's more reliable and more people are going to use it and then it's going to incentivize more people to get into mining like because even think about like now that we've got blackrock and these etfs getting into it if they start putting that piece together that's like well well if we invest in power companies that can mine the bitcoin then that's another way that they can start obtaining bitcoin so maybe this this has a much bigger effect than just a Bitcoin ETF, which is going to be a huge development, but it could have many second order effects that get into the peripheral infrastructure that is related to Bitcoin mining. So it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out, especially coming into a halving and seeing that there's there's a lot of miners out there that are very confident that they're going to be on the right side of the halving, but not everybody can be. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, my, my thoughts on mining, I've 
discussed them before in this podcast. I generally think the best mining strategy is to just stack sats and watch other people get wrecked while they mine. Because most people think, oh, I, I think the biggest misconception is people think that the mining means you can get cheaper Bitcoin. But if you look at the track record, mining means most likely you're getting more expensive bitcoins. Yeah, depends on your electricity price. Like, yeah, like exactly. It's primarily about the electricity price. But for the majority of people who have gotten into mining, they did not think that they needed so uh, very competitive uh, electricity prices. And in retrospect, they may have made dollars on it, but they had, did not make as much satoshis as they would have if they had just invested in buying bitcoin on the first day. But I think, uh, yeah, it's, it ultimately comes down to electricity price. And the only time it makes sense is if you already have access to a reliable energy source that you could count on for at least three years that can give you electricity reliably 24-7 for less than six cents per kilowatt hour, probably five, four, even three. You know, if you could get three, then I'd be confident in it. But there are no pl easy places where you could just sign up for three cents per kilowatt hour. They don't just don't make uh, three cents per kilowatt hour electricity. It's not easy to find it. If you happen to have it, if you happen to have access to it because you have you know, say, a, nat a stranded uh, natural gas field or if you've got a giant nuclear reactor that uh, sells electricity very cheaply because they have enormous capacity, then yeah, I think it makes sense. And I think this is this is why nuclear probably makes makes a lot of sense for mining because as you said if you you can build more capacity with a nuclear plant because so that it can last you into the future as the city grows and then to finance the gap or you know a few years while the, you have overcapacity you can use that for mining bitcoin that does seem to me to be a pretty compelling case for how mining happens i'm not sold on the idea that you know bitcoin mining is a, a lot of people try to market this idea that well the great thing about bitcoin mining is that you can just turn it off when it's uh when there's peak demand or when electricity is more expensive i think if you're having to do that then you're not going to make it as a miner if you have to turn down your mining when interest gets expensive your, your your machines during that downtime, your machines are depreciating without producing any satoshis. Your competition is connected twenty four seven, and they're hashing out new satoshis every second. So your you know Bitcoin mining is enormously competitive. There's no room out there for people who are not uh, competing competitive. So for me, it's a little bit like saying you know I'm going to be a, I'm going to be a professional athlete, but. I'm only going to train on weekends because, you know, sometimes I'm going to be busy with, you know, nights out or something like that. And that just doesn't happen at the top level of any uh, athletic endeavor. Like if you're going to be out there with the best players, they're out there training every day and you can't cut it. And I think it's kind of like that with uh, Bitcoin mining. Yeah, like at least like with the nuclear reactors, predominantly, like if you have lots of excess, the, the demand spikes aren't are fairly infrequent like as, as long as you're only turning off for maybe a few hundred hours a year like you, you you can make it work and it also depends on the other strategies that you use like if you if you just have a bunch of just old asics lying around that are less efficient they can just be kicked on because like right now a lot of this power infrastructure what they will do when they have excess they, either they will bleed steam or they will just pump it into a capacitor and just just let it go to ground and just just just, just basically just destroy it and that was that could have had value but because there was nobody available to consume it at the moment that it was generated it was it, it was valueless and now the miners can add value to that kilowatt that was otherwise just pissed away into the ground but yeah i, I definitely get what you're saying that, that, that there, there, there are going to be trade-offs and different strategies that need to be employed but like that's one of the reasons why i foresee more energy companies as they start to understand what this offers to them just just on the degree like the, the flexibility for them is good like if you're if you're the miner and you have to flex all the time and you're not being compensated for it like at least like when there's markets where there is the, the, the demand response market where you can you can have uh where all the like the ERCOT's the perfect example for that where they like every time that the demand spikes over like uh what was it like 100 dollars per megawatt the entire mining fleet turns off and that's like two gigawatts gets freed up to the grid and it only goes spikes up for like three four hours for the most part and then it comes back down and then they go back up and some of these miners have even been making more money playing the energy markets than they have actually mining bitcoin so it's 
Well, that's not saying much because all of these miners are losing money buying Bitcoin at this point. So. True, but like that's where the strategy is going to be. It's going to be that's how they're going to be more economized than their competitors is that they will have alternative streams to earn revenue that are then just mining Bitcoin. The problem is that their competitors are hooked up to you know um, dams in Kazakhstan or Peru yeah. or you know all over the world where there's really cheap excess capacity electricity and they can switch it. To, they can switch on their miners twenty four seven. That's the real competition, and that's why you know I just saw something today on Twitter. Somebody was saying that basically all the uh, Bitcoin mining public companies have been bleeding money. Now that they've all been losing money over the last uh, few years. And I think, um, I mean, they, uh, they 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 talk a big game about the fact that they're helping the grid with all of that stuff. But you know, um, you still need to pay your own bills first before you can uh, be a philanthropist towards other people's grids. I'm I'm not convinced this model scales for Bitcoin mining. I'm not convinced that we're going to mine on the times when the grid is not at full capacity is going to really make sense, unless. In places where you just really have extremely high overcapacity, which is only going to really be possible and cheap, I believe, in nuclear or hydroelectric. That's likely where it's uh, because th th these are the places where you can get really cheap electricity. Other than that, if it has fuel, if it's going to run on uh, gas or oil or diesel, it's just not going to cut it most likely. No, those are not the ideal power sources for it because they have their marginal fuel costs that can go all over the place. Exactly. Like, like it was, yeah, we, we saw that during the, the euphoria of 2021 where there was, everyone was chasing down to try and get those, those orphan wells available. And then, then the market flipped and then natural gas was now more profitable to sell it to the market again. So they left a lot of Bitcoin miners that had entered that market kind of stranded and looking for different strategies so it would there, yeah there's just so many different moving parts to to how it can all be played out and like yeah i like i agree with you it's not going to be like a perfect scenario but if we can use it as a strategy to even pull the roi on some of these like large capital investments like a nuclear reactor pull it to forward like three four five years like that can make a huge difference on the confidence of the investors to even just invest in these projects to begin with, because that's one of the biggest hangups on in building like these large power infrastructure, like nuclear reactors and, and hydroelectric dams. Like I, during a lot of my reading, you find that there was proposed this large power asset was going to be built and then the market shifted and then the electricity wasn't, was, was cheaper from other, some other source and there wasn't as much demand for it. So we just, we put four years of planning into this large project. We spent millions, millions of dollars, but because the market shifted, we're just going to scrap it. It's just, it's, they don't, it's hard to maintain that, that, that time preference that you need to build a 40 year project, like a nuclear reactor and consider that, yeah, the market is going to change. Like I explained like earlier with, with Quebec, like they had a strategy that worked at one period of time that does not work now because the market around them has shifted the way that their neighbors have responded to their energy needs and they become dependent upon a neighbor, which in this day and age does not seem like a winning strategy as we're seeing from many of the countries that had in Europe that had made themselves dependent upon on fuel from, from Russia that's now being blocked off from them accessing it. And then they had to quickly pivot to finding new alternative fuel sources, which is why many of them are now saying we want nuclear. And we were in this situation where everyone wanted nuclear 15 years ago. And there was a lot of generation three reactors being built. Like that was when the first, like the AP 1000s were first entering the market. But then Fukushima happened and then everybody got scared off again and the market dried up. And 10 years later, we went through a, a we, we, we tried all of these wind and solar strategies, they they haven't really fulfilled the promise that they have put forward, that they will be super cheap and, and available and reliable. And yeah, now we're seeing everyone's pivoting back to nuclear power. Like it, it was a noticeable shift in late 2021 where it went from, it, it just, it felt like public sentiment towards nuclear power went from being like negative and kind of meh to being more predominantly in favor of nuclear power and it, it was 
it, it was very, very noticeable. And then e even amongst like these pro nuclear activists groups that up until 2021, like they would show up at the COP conferences and they would basically get shunned and shoved into a, like a corner by themselves. And the, the wind and solar activists didn't want any nuclear activists anywhere near their protests. It was a very weird situation that was that was going off there's actually a really good documentary about the some of the guys from generation atomic called uh atomic hope and it just goes through the struggles of being a pro-nuclear advocate in, over the last few years and how things have changed positively in our favor and then like other nuclear movies i highly recommend people check out is the roger stone's oliver stone's new movie the uh nuclear now like he did a great job of that and then I haven't watched Oppenheimer yet, but I heard it's really good as as like a history exposition type of type of movie. Good acting. They might have sold a few of the, the concepts a little little far and, and made it a big like, oh my God, we we're, what have we done? We could totally destroy the world idea and like really implanting that idea into people's minds. Like we had discussed earlier that it that it's just it's a story that we've told ourselves that have assumptions that don't seem to ever get revisited. But now everyone lives under the assumption that yeah, if if some but one person throws a nuclear bomb, then everyone's going to throw a nuclear bomb, and then we're all doomed. Yeah, but there's no counterfactual to that. We we don't know. Yeah, and of course, to hear the hysterical reaction as well, you don't want to find out. And you know, no. there comes a point where there comes a point where you have to live your life and stop letting people manipulate you with fear. And the idea that this bomb can destroy the world, I think, is. Massively outlandish, but hey, I have been wrong before, so who knows? Maybe I'm wrong again. Yeah, uh, you just you, you see what sticks, but the trends that we're going on, I think I think we're going to come out of this okay. I hope so. I hope so. I think nuclear power really is a, a massive, massive question because we, you know, as much as I love hydrocarbons, it's a much bigger win if we can just get nuclear powers. They're just going to make electricity so much more reliable and cheaper for people all over the world who can have access to it, and that's just going to make life so much better. Yeah, especially now that we're hoping to bring to market a much larger range of sizes of reactors that can fit into different applications, like like little five megawatt reactors that'll be perfect for replacing diesel generation in remote communities in northern Canada, like eight, 80 megawatt reactors that'll be ideal for small communities or, or like large industrial operations, like like hospitals, like a big hospital takes like almost a 30 megawatts just to maintain its operations so like they would be ideal to have just be powered just straight by a nuclear reactor and then that would probably even power like if they had that an isolated area should the larger grid go out like they could maintain themselves and several blocks around them and be like kind of safe havens should there be major outages because i was reading something recently there was a project in New York where somebody installed like this completely self-contained grid. And then all the power was out in New York, except for like this little two square block area where I guess they installed these gigantic generators into this facility. And they, they want to make it completely self-contained and self-sustainable regardless of what happens on the, the wider grid around them. So it was a really impressive feat. I don't know what the hell it was called though, but it was, it was pretty cool to, to read about how, how they put it together and the fact that the costs that they had just to like stop traffic for a few days to, to lift these generators into the buildings like they they clearly see that it's going to be a valuable project if they're willing to put that much capital forward to build it in the first place but we shall see yeah all right one final question what do you think of thorium is thorium just the vaporware of the nuclear industry or is it real Thorium's got potential. It's a little bit more complicated of a supply chain because thorium isn't naturally fissile. It's it's they refer to it as fertile. It can be made fissile, but it first has to be exposed to a neutron environment to turn it into the, the correct isotope that's required to be fissile. So there's potential, but it's so much easier to use uranium because like the Canadian reactors it doesn't even need any level of enrichment it just needs to be refined and basically we can dig the dirt out of the ground purify it into pure uranium and use it in a reactor and then most of the other reactors require like three to three to five percent enrichment and that the enrichment percentage is just the the uranium-235 isotope relative to the uranium-238 isotope because 238 is the more abundant one but it isn't fissile the 235 is fissile so that's why the concentration of 235 is ramped up for various applications for the reactors. So the Canadian reactors use natural uranium, 
most reactors in the PWR, BWR fleet use two to 5%, and then some reactors use up to 20% react, uh, enrichment. And then you get into like the nuclear submarines are up in the 80, 90% enrichment, and then nuclear weapons, you require like 90% enrichment. And it is incredibly energy intensive and costly operation to be able to enrich uranium to that point. So I, I, I was at one point, I was an advocate for down blending that uranium and then using it in conventional reactors, but the capital cost already put into enriching that uranium and it can still be used. Like there, there are types of reactors that can use that highly enriched uranium. We should be using it for that instead of basically undoing all of the investment that was made to enrich it in the first place. Like, although that is potentially weapons grade uranium, it has many other market value to it as well for like the submarine fleet and there are some research reactors that can use that sort of fuel so it can have value and then on like other just marketable um, commodities that can come out of nuclear power like first off a lot of people aren't familiar with the amount of medical isotopes that are generated from nuclear reactors between the uh, uh, cobalt 60 there's an isotope of lutetium americium no not americium there's like five or six isotopes that are routinely made like only in nuclear reactors then there's it's not cost effective just yet, but a lot of the byproducts in the spent fuel rods are actually like usable rare metals that can be used for many other industries. Like a lot of those rare metals that are needed for the batteries and the solar panels actually are generated inside of a nuclear reactor during the fission process. They're, they're daughter byproducts of uranium, the fission. And so some of them, once it's cost effective to do so or, or the market finds a cost effective way to extract those like they they can sell that on the market and then other things like tritium which is a big topic right now with fukushima if purified and concentrated to a, like a, a pure tritium form that's worth like 50 or forty thousand dollars a gram to fusion companies that will pay it because that they use tritium as fuel for the fusion research and potentially if we ever do get fusion reactors operational they're going to need a substantial amount of tritium as their fuel so there's like any industry nuclear is trying to find clever ways to take what would be a waste byproduct and find marketable ways to actually make further value off of it but because it is in a slurry with all kinds of other highly irradiated metals it's cost prohibitive at the moment to be able to do that but yeah maybe maybe someday in the future we will be able to do that and that's why one of the strategies for waste is they want to store it in deep geological repositories where it can be retrievable if when we do have the technology in the future that we can further extract extract some of the valuable minerals that are still in them because even there's still uranium in these fuel rods that can still be used in many instances like like the typical can do rods only get about 10% of the available energy in the uranium. So when the spent rods go out to storage, there's still potentially like 90% of the electricity available to extract and, and use in a different reactor. So that's why they use like the, the breeder reactors where they can just dissolve it into a molten salt and then they're able to extract more energy out of it and then also further decay the nucleides that they don't have any value for so that there will be less of them at the end of the life so there'll be less footprint for the waste that needs to be stored for the long term which is already pretty minuscule to begin with relative to other competing energy technologies yeah well thank you so much ryan for all of this uh, e extremely valuable and useful information uh, where can people find you and learn more about you and uh, take part in your work or do whatever it is that you want them to do yeah i'm most active on twitter as nuclear bitcoiner i'm trying to use nostr more say at nuclear bitcoiner also the same and then i'm on orange pill app and i'm getting around i'm hoping hoping to make it to the african bitcoin conference in december that's my next big adventure. And then in the meantime, it's, yeah, keeping keeping things sane for my life and my family and my day-to-day -day job and trying to go on. And But it's it's nice to have these opportunities to talk with Bitcoiners that see what I see because, yeah, not many people in the world see what I see. Like I could go around and just ask random people around my site and, and, and be all excited and be like, I get to talk to Safety and Amus today and be like, who the fuck is that? And most of them, they won't, yeah. they won't even know. I like it that way. It's better. <laughs>
but then like yeah in the bitcoin That's circles fine. like you're you're a rock star you wrote the book yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah but bitcoin circles are pretty small uh, for now at least oh but it's fun it's fun it's optimistic it is it is it's it's the quality not the quantity of people <laughs> oh yeah absolutely all right well thank you so much ryan really appreciate your time have a good day yeah thanks for having me that was great cheers take care bye